Smoky session, ho. Right back at you with another motherfucking video. Listen, we're going to do something a little bit different today. You feel me? I got a long video called what, what pretending to be crazy looks like. Listen, I've been hearing a lot of shit about this. That's the only reason why that's the only reason why we here today. You know, most of the time I do my own shit. I'm do what the fuck I want when I want uh, and can't nobody stop that. But I have been seeing a lot of buzz on this shit. A lot of people been talking about it, commenting on it, so I had to get in here and see what the fuck they talking about. What pretending to be crazy looks like. Let me know how y'all doing today in the motherfucking smoking section. And let me know what the fuck you smoking on while you down there as well. You feel me? Go tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend, bitch. Tell your motherfucking mom and them. Show me love or don't show me shit. We gonna die right into this motherfucking video. And while I'm in that motherfucking video, you gonna see me go ahead and light my blood. I'm blowing on some motherfucking do -si though today. You know she go. <laughs> do -si though. You know she go. Listen, I'm just bringing you the motherfucking news. If you don't like it, just stay the fuck off my tube. Game time. This is 26-year-old Dawson McGee, sitting in a police interrogation room in the early hours of a Tuesday morning. The Monday night before, he stabbed his own mother to death for asking him to move out of the house and get a job. Dawson is unaware that he- Nigga, what? That nigga killed his mama for asking him to move out and get a job? Wow. He recorded on a hidden camera. In three seconds from now, you will hear the sound of the door being opened by a detective. Mm. And at that exact moment, you will see a remarkably noticeable switch in his demeanor. Mm. And he was on cue, too. You see the crazy, you was in the corner. Um, looks like he's been laughing Crazy like a motherfucker. Mm. Okay. Let's Was your sister home this weekend? Mm. That nigga. Oh, that nigga play. Hey, that nigga playing crazy. But he ain't crazy enough to ask for no goddamn attorney. Well, that's up to you if you, if you like one. But uh, we'd like to talk to you. Um, Hell no. Nah. Yeah. Okay. It would come as no surprise that a judge deemed him fit to stand trial. A jury then found him legally sane, and he was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of his mother. Mm. All of which was in spite of a continuous charade of mental illness similar to the one you see here. Hell Dawson no. clearly believed that his passage through the legal system would somehow be easier if he were presumed insane. Which right. is a naive, yet somewhat common misconception that many suspects make when facing serious charges. They have this notion that a plea of insanity would either lower the severity of their punishment, or liberate them from it altogether. Right. That instead of being sent to prison, they would simply be released back into society. Perhaps with a free psychotherapeutic program to attend on the weekends. This mm. is, of course, a far cry from reality. In the United States, if you're found responsible for a serious offense, but also found not guilty of the crime by reason of insanity, you will be institutionalized at a high-security psychiatric facility. These institutions are without question some of the darkest and most disturbing places in the system. And if you're not actually suffering from the crippling effects of mental illness, living in this type of environment will be a mentally agonizing experience. Well, you'll be crazy for sure after living in there. Like the majority wish to avoid them. But once you are in, it is very hard to get out, mm. and you will have to serve the same, if not a greater amount of time than you would have had to serve at a regular prison. So to put it briefly, if you commit a serious offense and then pretend to be crazy in order to get away with it, your life from that point forward will be an extremely dark and uncomfortable existence whether you manage to fool the system or not. Mm. But there is one benefit, which is the elimination of capital punishment. 
The United States cannot execute someone deemed insane during the time of their offense, which is okay. the only conceivable reason a defendant would cling to this narrative even after knowing what lies ahead should it succeed. And this happens to be a notion that ties in closely to the primary subject of this video. It will focus on one particular individual whose interrogation footage is so fraught with blatant trickery that most of the segments presented to you won't even need suggestive commentary. Mm. You can simply observe and judge for yourself whether you see authentic behavior or not. But before showing you what pretending to be crazy looks like, we'll briefly show you a genuine case of the criminally insane, or at least a far more convincing one. This is 18-year-old Jared Murray, a freshman at East Central University in Oklahoma. On a Wednesday evening in December, he asked fellow student Gennaro Sanchez for a ride to Walmart. Once they got there, Murray pulled out a handgun and made Gennaro drive to an isolated country road where he shot him twice in the head. He then attempted to hitchhike to Canada, but was soon apprehended by police on the side of the road. He immediately confessed to the crime once apprehended, and was then interrogated by the arresting officer. Uh, wow. And asked if I could be given a ride to Walmart in exchange for $20 gas money. So he took you to Walmart? Yes, sir. And did you both go in? No, he did not go in, sir. We pulled into the parking lot, then I pulled the uh, weapon on him and demanded that he take me to Asher, Oklahoma, sir. Okay, and why did all of a sudden did you decide that you need to go to Asher? Because I was planning to take him out into the country and kill him. Mm. Okay. Did he say anything? <coughs> uh, he panicked. I uh, went to pull out his phone, I inked the phone out of his hand, and then he panicked some more, kept telling me not to kill him. To make him feel more comfortable, I unloaded the clip, unloaded the bullet from the chamber, handed them over to him, and that eased his nerves a little. Then I pulled a second clip out of my pocket and set it on my lap. Mm. And so you're driving east, and so I guess at some point, did you decide it was, now was the time? Yes, sir. Okay, and what happened? Uh, I loaded the gun quickly, chambered the round quickly, uh, shot once, missed, shot a second time, hit, jumped out of the car, mm. went around, he was driving 10, 15 miles an hour, so it was rather slow, uh, ran around the hood of the car, and, and of course it was slow when he wasn't purposefully driving, uh, tried to pull him out, couldn't get him out until he already had hit the tree, pulled him out there, dumped him into the, uh, no, before I dumped him into the ditch, I heard him a gurgling. Uh, I'm not sure if that was a physiological or physical process after death, but uh, I thought that he might have still lived through that somehow because he was gurgling. So I shot him again and then shoved him down in the ditch. Mm. He makes a half hearted attempt crazy to conceal hell, the bro. body with a handful of leaves and a stick. He then walks in the direction of the highway. Did you get back on the highway? Yes, sir. And which way did you go? No, sir. And what were your intentions? Uh, you walking north. Canada, sir. You were going to Canada? Yes, sir. Okay. He states that his plan was to escape into Canada, but he had nothing to escape with, not even a passport. I had tried hitchhiking uh, part of, uh, most of the way because the only way this was going to work, uh, factoring in uh, my belief that y'all found the crime scene, is if someone were to give me a ride there and then. And uh, then whenever your patrol car uh, was pulling up behind me, I didn't know it was a patrol car. I started to come out and you was there for the rest. Mm. You know, I want to ask you at this point, right? Because, I mean, you you sat here and confessed to. Pretty much everything. In my mind, and I think you might agree with me, just cold rather than killed a young man tonight. Yes, sir. Right. So, have you ever killed anybody else? No, sir. You will now see the detective attempt yeah, I mean, to establish a motive for the crime. I guess I'm having a hard time understanding. He was straightforward with the shit. Yeah, I killed him. Can you, can, you, can you help me? I don't really get anything out of it. Do you feel any remorse? I'm sad that I got caught mm. so quickly. Tell me why I should believe you that there just was going to be one person that was going to suffer from your consequences of killing. You have no reason to believe me, sir. I guess I'm just having a real hard time understanding why. The detective fails to establish a solid motive for a further two minutes. The discussion eventually lands on the victim's long-term girlfriend. You don't think she's going to be upset, heartbroken? 
I think she will be, sir. How did that make you feel? No different, sir. Okay. I think you've been honest with me. I think you've told me just straight up, right out of the book. What happened? Yes, sir. But, um, you know, you've done a terrible thing tonight. Yes, sir. Um, you killed a young man. Yes, sir. Just for the simple fact of... And he seemed kind of disciplined and shit. That's what he did. Much, pretty much this is safe for you. Yes, sir. And what do you think should happen to you? Death sentence, sir. Damn. And why do you think you deserve death sentence? Yeah, I wasn't even expecting that nigga to be that goddamn honest. An eye for an eye, sir. Did you bring an eye for an eye? Yes, sir. Mm. Jared Murray was found not guilty by reason of insanity. He was committed to a high security mental facility where he is to remain indefinitely. Anything to say for yourself today? No, ma'am. Any reason why you're the dumbest, this young man? No, ma'am. No reason? No, ma'am. You have nothing to say for yourself? No, ma'am. You want to tell the community? I know, a cat, I went to school to look just like that. Did you My fucking name police? was L. Yes, ma'am. Are you proud of what you've done? No, ma'am. Do you have remorse for what you've done? No, ma'am. He appears completely void of human emotion. No regret, remorse, shame, nor fear. He had both taken a life and destroyed his own, yet seems indifferent to the circumstances. With respect to his interrogation footage, the most conspicuous element was the complete lack of self-preservation. He didn't once it's attempt like they to got the WD-40 in there for or any type of justification for his actions. He simply spoke in a factual, non-biased manner, impartial to how his words may have been taken or even twisted to be used against him. There was no calculated structure to his behavior whatsoever. So with this notion in mind, let's move on to the primary subject of this video. Now we got the motherfuckers getting ready to act crazy. I know some niggas in there act crazy before. Shit don't work, though. Alright. Put your hands up. Have a seat. It's pretty to be up. Don't, do not think about getting up right, buddy. This is 19-year-old Nicholas Cruz, who three hours and 55 minutes prior to this moment, murdered 17 people at his former high school in Parkland, Florida. I remember Among that the shit. dead were three teachers and 14 students, the majority of whom were 14 years old. Mm. A further 17 students were seriously wounded during the massacre. The gunman dropped his rifle seven minutes into the rampage and then blended in with the crowd as he ran out of the building. He was at large for one hour and 20 minutes, during mm. which time he stopped off at a subway and then a McDonald's where he sat down and casually spoke to one of the victim's brothers. The student was unaware wow. that the Wow. Was shot through the chest by the man sitting across the table. The description of the shooter was transmitted by police over the. We all didn't heard the story, but I didn't know them details. That nigga sat down and talked to one of the victims' brothers. That's fucking wild. Yeah, which led to an officer identifying and arresting him on a street just two miles away from the school. He was taken to the nearest hospital and examined by a doctor for roughly one hour and 45 minutes. He was medically cleared and then transferred to the local sheriff's office where he was subjected to interrogation. Mm -mm -mm. Don't, do not think about getting up, right, buddy? From the moment the subject entered the room, his eyes have been fixed upon nothing but the floor. He's held on to this downward-facing gaze as if he's either in a state of shock or disconnected from the moment. At the exact moment the door shuts, he lifts up his head to observe his surroundings. His behavior completely shifts once he believes no one is watching. Mm. If we look at his demeanor a moment earlier, we can see the contrast. He went from being detached to alert. His behavior changed as the environment changed, right. which is a recurring theme throughout this interrogation. It shows us that his mind isn't wandering off during these moments of apparent disconnection. He is in fact fully present and very aware of what's going on around him. <laughs> 
As he looks up, his eyes immediately lock onto the camera. He now knows he is still being watched, and his following gestures will resemble that of someone with suicidal tendencies. At face value, these externalized suicidal thoughts may seem genuine to some, but when framed with the rest of his behavior throughout this interrogation, they are exposed for what they really are, an act, a calculated attempt to garner sympathy and paint his character in what he believes to be a more positive light. All right. All right, how you doing, Nick? You all right? Got to be able to speak so I can hear you. All right, I just need to ask you, really, your name and date of birth, just to confirm I got it right, and I'm going to see if you want a glass of water or something. What's your first name? This is a situation where the proof against the suspect is already conclusive. He is without question responsible for the crimes under investigation, making the pursuit of a confession non-essential. The police know he did it, but they need to know why he did it, which would already require a complex strategy in order to obtain the correct information. But the suspect's first recorded statements upon his arrest have now made the procedure considerably more difficult. What's going on today, bro? Yeah, demons, man. Demons? Voices. Voices. Voices and demons. Where's the voices? What happened? You killed a bunch of children. And he was able to be arrested with not a bruise on him. Just be quiet, man. <laughs> These two words have now forged the primary stratagem of his own interrogation, which is to cut through deception under the guise of supportive examination. The questions will be designed to lock him into a specific narrative about his alleged psychosis, while simultaneously giving him the impression that his responses are for his own benefit. Anything he says now can be used to refute any amendments he might come up with at a later stage. We all know that after this interrogation, he will have significantly more time to think, study, and even seek guidance from professionals about how the legal system interconnects with mental illness. Yet the majority of this forthcoming knowledge could be useless to him depending on what he says during these moments. The more details he gives away, the less options he will have for his defense later on. But pursuing this objective is complicated, as there are two very common scenarios for when this type of suspect gets interrogated. And just to be entirely clear, by this type of suspect, we mean someone who is, one, pretending to be insane and two, not fooling anyone. Their most common response is to simply shut down. They regress into total silence or some type of catatonic state, and the interrogation never gets off the ground. The other common response is the exact opposite. They erupt into hysteria or supposed delirium, and everything from that point forward becomes incoherent. The lead detective, John Curcio, must not allow either of these scenarios to transpire, and this makes the first two minutes absolutely crucial. He needs to create a positive first impression and resemble the furthest thing from a threat, while at the same time maintain a presence of authority. His temperament will be easygoing and non-confrontational, but also encouraging when extracting a response. His role at this moment is the ally. He needs to be liked, respected, but must not be feared. Not yet anyway. Going off the suspect's initial demeanor, the detective will know that he is far more likely to regress into a state of silence at this opening stage. And if he can prevent that from happening within the first two minutes, he is over the first obstacle. All right. How you doing, Nick? I just need to ask you, really, your name and date of birth, just to confirm I got it right, and I'm going to see if you want a glass of water or something. What's your first name? But if you the good cop, who the bad cop? Huh? Spell it for me. Come on, I'm, I'm old. You gotta talk so I can hear you. N I K O. Okay. A S. And what's your middle name? Come on, man. Speak so I can hear you. Jacob. Jacob. J A C. What's your date of birth? 
Okay, you need to relax because I'm the last detective or policeman you're going to have to talk to. So right off the bat, that should be somewhat comforting to you to know that I'm the last guy you've got to talk to. But the thing about it is, look at me, I've got to be able to hear you. Okay? So all I want to do is get basic information from you, and then we'll get into the, you know, when you want a glass of water, all that stuff. What's your date of birth? Zero nine. January? Zero nine. Zero nine, September. The investigation team already know the answers to these basic questions. Right. Their only purpose are to initiate a response, and their non-threatening nature make it more likely for the suspect to engage. They are essentially the opening wedge to get the two-way dialogue flowing. And although the suspect is still partially committed to his catatonic state, as we can clearly see, he is still responsive, making it unlikely for him to regress into complete silence from this point forward. Everything up to this moment has gone to plan. The detective has one foot in the door, and he can now develop the relationship from a more secure position. He goes about this with a standard method of rapport development, the offer of food and water. All right, let me do this. You want, you want cold water? You know, if you want cold water? Thank you, Robert. You better too, get that cold water. Because I want one that was, that was hot, and if you decide you want to have it, that's fine. You sure you don't want uh, something to eat? Okay. The refusal to accept food and water mm -hmm. is a familiar response which you may have already seen on this channel. It's a glaring manifestation of shame. This is not to be confused with guilt nor remorse, both of which require the acceptance of responsibility, which in turn directs our focus outwards on the feelings of others. Shame, on the other hand, shifts our focus on the perceptions of others towards ourselves. The subject is afraid of how it will look if he accepts the offer Fuck of being so nice to this man. He instead oh. wants to appear as if he's so negatively affected by the events that he's unconcerned with meeting his basic needs. Of course, I have so many different keys. Once again, his demeanor abruptly switches when the detective leaves the room. With his head buried in his hands, it's anyone's guess as to what is going through his mind at this moment. But what you are about to see next is extremely revealing. Cruz was a left-handed shooter. The surveillance at the school would confirm this, and if you pay close attention to the movements of his hands in the next moments, although very subtle, you can see that he's reimagining holding his weapon. Mm. But what's more telling is how his demeanor abruptly stops and then completely switches right before he looks in the direction of the camera. He goes from holding a rifle and beginning to smirk, to then pretending to cry and reverting back to his suicidal mannerisms. This all occurs in under four seconds. <laughs> It could be assumed that for a brief moment, he was not only recollecting the attack, but gaining gratification from doing so. He then remembered he was on film, giving reason for the sharp adjustment. His true self was reliving the attack and enjoying his work, while his false self was so dejected to the point he was externalizing suicidal thoughts. Complete opposites. <laughs> His next calculated charade is one of self-harm. He first bites himself without drawing blood, or leaving any marks that were visible in his jail intake photographs. Hell no. He then scratches and squeezes at the two needle punctures in his arm from where his blood was taken at the hospital. At the very moment the detective re-enters the room, he will act as if he's desperately trying to conceal his self-injurious behavior. All right. 
Setting aside the glaring contradiction that he just murdered and maimed dozens of people while leaving himself without so much as a scratch, it's the frequency of these little charades that makes their deception so transparent. This is a person who is not self-injurious, pretending to be someone that is. But it's such a feeble attempt at feigned self-harm, it would almost be a comical moment if the circumstances weren't as horrific. Right. Alright, this one is mine. Because I already opened up this one, Jewel, in case you change your mind. That cold water city the asked them for a cold water. I want to This process of getting the subject to engage further through basic questions. The topic of his phone will now be brought up. What about your phone? Do you have a phone? When did you lose it? Today? Yeah. Okay. And what kind of phone is it? I don't know. Okay, is it a flip top, an iPhone, a, a Samsung? Uh, it's a phone. What's it's the a number? Phone. I can't remember. Okay. He will now begin to feign a state of hysteria, which then morphs into a simulated panic attack and fake hyperventilation. The detective will need to refute the act immediately as to not let the subject gain confidence with it, but he also has to maintain rapport and avoid confrontation. He essentially has to tell the subject to knock it off, but in the most passive manner possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nick. Nick, calm down. You've already been medically cleared. I know mm. what's going to be talked about is difficult, mm -hmm. but again, you don't remember your phone number. How long have you had the phone? That's when you need the bad cop to come in and rough him up a little bit. Snatch him. Where the fuck is the How phone? Long have you had the phone? Knock some of, that ga knock some of the games out of his yeah, motherfucking mouth. He's already looked at you. Okay. Okay, you're fine. You're not having any problems at the moment, and you're perfectly fine. So calm your breathing down, all right? And and I want to believe certain things that you're going to tell me, but, you know, if we're getting to where you're going to hyperventilate over a phone number. Uh, okay. All right. All right. So what's your phone number? Huh? 954. Okay, 954. The manic episode is somewhat curved, but the subject is still clearly committed to it. 954-821-2007. Uh, again, going back to what kind it is. Do you know if it's an iPhone, a Samsung? How long you had? Every kid knows what the phone is. Right, well, you, know you know what phone you got. I know, maybe not that. That's what I was going to talk about next. This is a turning point. Cruz's adoptive mother had indeed passed away the year prior from pneumonia. The topic is sympathetic towards himself, and it seems to have stopped the feigned hysteria in its tracks. Compared to his neurotic behavior in the minutes leading up to this moment, he all of a sudden appears calm. He is clearly receptive, and thus responsive, to the cue of compassion when it's directed at himself. Mm. The detective recognizes this, and although he said he would talk about the subject's mother next, he instead focuses on it immediately to keep him engaged. Alright, so, <coughs> so you had, since your mom died, how long has your mom passed? I can't remember, I think. Okay. This okay. year or last year? No. Okay. Okay, when you were, when your mom passed, were you living with her? Yes. Okay. What city was that? Parkland. The subject drops the act and becomes more engaged in the conversation. The detective inquires further about his mother for roughly three minutes before shifting the discussion. It mm. focuses mainly on the subject's background, and he first declares that he was depressed for the majority of his childhood. He then reveals his history of drug use, which consists of marijuana and Xanax. After that, he claims to have attempted suicide by alcohol poisoning two years and ago, but in his own words, was able to sleep it off. He then states that he was employed at the Dollar Tree for the last two years working as a cashier. You've been able to hold down a job for two years, that's pretty good, right? Yes. Other than Dollar Tree, where else did you ever work? Lawnmower. What? Lawnmower. Lawnmower? Oh, okay. All right, when you tried to kill yourself with alcohol, your mom was still alive. What were you depressed about back then? Mm. Loneliness. Loneliness? Loneliness. Friends? No friends? Or 
What's what, what? What kind of lonely? I mean, everybody gets lonely. Solitude. Solitude. You don't have a lot of friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Today, when I say today, starting from last night when you went to bed to this morning, did you do any kind of drugs at all? Any Xanax? Any marijuana? Anything like that? No. Okay. The subject reveals that he has a biological brother whom he was adopted with. He then claims to have been making $1,200 a month at the Dollar Tree. The discussion now lands on what his aspirations were. When you weren't depressed, what did you want to be? When you got a ranger. ranger, an army ranger. Did you ever apply to any paperwork to try to go to the army? I took, I took the asthma, failed. Okay, why did you fail? It's not stupid. You what? I'm stupid. You're stupid? Okay. Were you going to take it again? I was afraid to take it. Okay. But you had aspirations to, to do something with your life. You want to be a, oh, that's a, that's a whole other thing. You want to be an army ranger. The discussion moves on to the subject's gun collection, which continues for roughly four and a half minutes. The attack on the school is yet to be mentioned, but the last gun to now be discussed was his choice of weapon to commit the massacre. What made you choose out of all the guns to want to buy an AR-15? Cool looking. Cool looking. Ain't that about a bitch. Now when you bought it, I mean it was a legitimate purchase, they gave you a receipt and everything, right? So you bought it legally, right? You fill, did you fill out those forms and everything? Okay, you remember those forms? Okay. The detective now shifts the topic onto his former high school, the same place he carried out the attack. Now, three years ago when you went to, to Douglas, and obviously you stopped going there, why'd you stop going there? The depression worsened. The depression worsened, and what, what was going on? Was they, you know, did you just stop school on your own, or did some incident happen where? Yes, an incident. What was the incident that happened? Fought a kid. You fought a kid. You remember the kid's name? Yeah. Mm. And did you guys both get in trouble for the fight, or? Yeah. Okay. Well, what did they do? Suspend you? Suspended me. Okay. And what happened from there? Did you, after you got suspended, you go back to school? Yeah. Okay, what happened? Why did you stop going there then? I felt embarrassed. You felt embarrassed because you got suspended, or, or you felt embarrassed because of what? Because of the fight. Okay. Well, what was, what was embarrassing about the fight? Ian must have whooped about? his ass. Girl. Girl? Well, what was embarrassing about it? I mean, did Ian get the better of you? Mm -hmm. Was that what was embarrassing? Or did yeah. you just you think he had the better of you? Mm hmm. Okay. He has just provided the state. He didn't put them paws on that nigga. Establishing a reason for an offense is critical when dealing with crimes of insanity. It can not only indicate premeditation, but also calculated malice in connection to the crime. Something considered absent in the mind of the criminally insane. He also asserts that he was lonely and depressed while attending the school. All of which can reinforce the argument that he was exacting revenge upon the community in which he felt ostracized. Alright, so you go back to school. What ends up happening? You just stop going to school out there? Or they, you got into more problems? Or they got into more problems. Mm -hmm. what, was the, what, was the, what was the more problems? They were in class. Okay. I'm going to school. Okay. And this is all while your mom was still alive? Yeah. Okay. Did there come a point in time where you just stopped going there or they expelled you? No, I just stopped going and then transferred me. They transferred you? When they transferred you, that, did, that was that upsetting to you? Yeah. Okay. As but we know, going the suspect now. has made the claim about hearing a voice which he labeled the demon. The detective will now attempt to get a detailed narrative of these perceptual disturbances. He will do so by asking a series of open-ended questions, and then continuous follow-up questions thereafter. This will lock him into specific claims about what he was hearing. The more information he gives away, the less he will be able to amend later on. And the more questions that are posed, the more likely he is to make contradictions that can be used against him. The suspect believes this is some type of clinical evaluation for the sake of his own well-being, and this misconception will become glaringly apparent later on. He, at this moment, is oblivious to the fact he is giving information away that will be used to cut through his own defense in years to come. So when you go to the hospital, the doctors clear you, and you're, t and you're talking about demons. What are the demons? Voices. 
Well, tell me about it. What are the voices about? It's, it's, an, it's another voice, the evil side. Okay. And how long has that voice been going on? Years. Did you ever tell anybody about the voice? Never? And what does the voice say to you? Burn, kill, destroy. Okay, burn, kill, destroy what? Anything. Mm -hmm. But have you ever burned, killed, or destroyed anything? Mm -hmm. What have you burned, killed, or destroyed? Burned, just fire, just set fire. To, to in what? Pit. In a pit, fire. Oh, a fire pit, okay, well. I mean, the voice told you to burn something, you built, built a fire. Fire pit. <laughs> What's destructive about that? That's what fire pits are made for. What else did the voice tell you to do that's... Kill animals. Okay, have you ever killed animals? Yes. What kind of animals? Birds. Birds? Wild birds or people's birds. pets? How do you kill them? Birds. How do you kill them? Maybe kill them. Kill them. Oh, can't catch them, so how are you waiting for them? Out in the, in, in the grass, wait for a bird to come up. There's no way that. I'm, I'm, I'm a bird lover. There's no way. You can't catch a bird, Holmes. No, I mean like... I, but, but, or with the pelican? Oh, okay. Where's, where's your pelican? It broke. Okay. All right, so the voices tell you to, to, to herd animals and start fires in the fire pit. When was the last time you heard the voice? Yesterday. What time was it yesterday? Maybe at night. Okay. And where were you at? You got to work, so it's Dollar Tree. And what's the voice telling you? Hurt to hurt people. To hurt people at Dollar Tree? Or hurt people? <laughs> okay. Doesn't say specifically who? Alright. Can you tell how old the voice is? My age. Okay. Do you have a good voice too, or just a bad voice? Is there, is, there, is there a voice inside you that says, do good things? The detective will now start getting confrontational, and the subject's behavior will shift once more in response. You will see him get defensive as he attempts to protect his narrative, and his responses will become much faster. He will even cut the detective off multiple times. Keep in mind that he was barely saying anything at the start of this interrogation. No? So it's bad. Can't be. You held down a job for two years. If you were doing things bad, you wouldn't be able to hold a job down for two years, right? Okay. I mean, look. Everybody it's has... Everybody, it's, me, it's me and then my bad side. I understand. Everybody's got the quote, good and bad side. There's people... No, it's, it's, it's a voice. The voice you hear. And it's me. It's just me. It's trying to get me this. Okay. Set aside his contradicting behavior for a moment and focus solely on his storyline. In his ideal scenario, we are to believe that he was battling these supposed voices and All in right. his own words, trying to be a good person. Yet he was unable to reveal or seek help for this internal struggle until the very moment of his arrest. It was quite literally the second he was confronted with his comeuppance that his supposed demons came to light. Now that he is in custody... It's because he's full of shit. With the atrocities already committed, That's he is somehow able to maintain control over the force that was previously keeping him silent. But a deleted video that would later be extracted from his phone would tell a very different story. Mm. Hello. My name is Nick, and I'm going to be the next school shooter of 2018. My goal is at least 20 people with an AR-15 and a couple tracer rounds. I think I could do a good time. Location is Stone Douglas in Parkland, Florida. It's going to be a big event. And when you see me on the news, you'll all know who I am. There are no signs of perceptual disturbances. There is no anguish, doubt, hesitation, or uncertainty when announcing his intentions. By his own narrative, he claims to have continuously fought against the evil intentions of the voice. Yet, from a visual standpoint, there is no conflict in this video whatsoever. It's me and then my bad side. I understand. Everybody's got the quote, good and bad side. There's people... No, it's, it's, it's a voice. The voice is in here. And it's me. It's trying to get this. Okay. But, obviously, again, 
when you say it's a voice, it's you. It's all of you. The voice is you as well. Yeah. The voice didn't force you to do anything, right? No, the voice did. It's two voices. Mm-hmm. If there's one half, that's a good and then a bad. Yeah. But you just said His it don't have a good. His changing behavior has now gone from catatonic to manic to hallucinatory to now highly attentive and cautious. Okay, well, the voice tells me to go to lunch and not pay for my meal. But I pay for my meal because I know that's the right thing to do, right? Oh, yeah, let's talk about it. The, the, voice, the voice didn't tell you to take Uber, right? Yes, it did. It did? Yes. The voice said take Uber. Yes. The, the, voice, the, vo- the voice is, is in me. You're the voice. There's, there's the, in, in here. Okay, it's in your head. Yes. What, is it a male voice or a female voice? Yeah. Male. Male? <laughs> The subject was beginning to panic, but yeah, the detective it dials it in boy. for the time being and switches the discussion back to more trivial matters. It seems that he wants to consult with the investigators outside before maximizing the pressure, and he re-establishes a certain level of trust before leaving the room. I'm going to go, I'm gonna go back and uh, see what everybody's doing as far as uh, what they need me to do. You're not a psychologist or anything? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm a... 59 year old man who's raised three children. So I guess that makes me somewhat of a psychologist. <laughs> can you a psychologist? Yeah. Uh, I can certainly ask. Okay. He want to see a psychologist. Have you ever seen a psychologist before? <laughs> but you need one now? The subject scratches his arm for another two minutes. He then switches to a hallucinatory state and appears to be seeing things in the room. All right. Hey, you seeing shit. Got The detective will once more dismiss the act by pretending to not see it. He will then mm-hmm. pose a question to the subject, and the charade will cease immediately. You the water. You put it back over here. You definitely don't want the water, huh? It's very interesting to observe his facial expressions at the exact moments he abandons fake behavior. These are the very brief junctures in which his true self appears to surface. It's easy to get distracted by the present situation as he sits there in a hospital gown chained to the floor, essentially helpless to the cunning devices being used against him. But in moments like this, we are reminded of what we're actually dealing with. A very short time ago, he was not helpless at all. all he right. was the one preying on the helpless, offering them none of the sympathy nor mercy of which he is now trying to garner for himself. All right, the schools or the psychologists you want to talk to... Obviously, you have to tell them what you want to talk to them about. So, what exactly do you what do you want me to ask them? Or what, why do you want to talk to a psychologist? Find out what's wrong with me. Well, what do you think's wrong with me? I don't know. The detective in this next segment will attain further information about the supposed voices, only he will no longer have to tread carefully in order to maintain a friendly connection. He will still secure useful information, but also get confrontational as and when he pleases. The risk of frightening the suspect to the point where it stops the interrogation is no longer a concern. When you hear the voices, are the voices like outside your head or inside your head when you hear them? Inside. Okay, so it's not like... You don't hear a voice from the corner talking to you. It's inside your head. And is it always the, the same voice or is it only one voice? One voice, yeah. And you said it's, it's, a, it's a man's voice? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Does it sound like anybody you've ever met? Anybody you've ever seen on TV? Can you tell, like, by an accent? Is it a, what kind of, is it an old man, young man, white man, young black, man? Young man? About the same age as you, you think? <laughs> There's only one voice you ever hear, right? Yes. Right. Do you hear the voice when you're in bed at night sleeping? Yes. Do you ever see anything with the voice? Like, a, a, you, know, like you know, some people say, oh, I see a person sitting in the corner. You don't see anybody sitting over there, do you? It's just me and you, right? <laughs> All right. Do you always obey what the voice tells you, then? I try not to. Okay. Well, how many 
On on any given week, how many times do you think you hear a voice? All the time? Once every day. Once every day? Morning, afternoon, night? Always the same time? Usually in the afternoon. About what time? (laughs) About lunch. 11, 12. Why do you think it's those hours? I don't know. It's always around lunchtime? (laughs) Now, you talked about demons. Yeah. And then you talk about yeah, the that's wolf. A demon. That, the voice is a demon. The voice is the demon. So there's the not the two. Person, whoever it is. Does it have a name? No name. Does it ever say, uh, hey, my name Nick, my name is Nick? Is it use your name or use somebody else's name? Just a, just, a, just a voice with no name. This voice has no name telling me what to do. Did the voice tell you to buy that AR-15? Yes. Did it tell you... Hey, buy that gun, it looks cool. Did the AR-15 get picked out because it was similar to the gun that an Army Ranger would carry? No, it was because of the voice. What do you think if you, if you didn't buy it, if you say, hey, I ain't buying these guns, it's too expensive, what do you think the voice would have done to you? Did you stop talking to you? No, I was trying to hurt myself. How, how would you hurt yourself? Cut. You're a cutter? I'm a cutter. Mm-hmm. Uh, when was the last time you cut yourself? Earlier. Earlier when? When I was fishing. Earlier today or earlier? Earlier today. Or were you fishing that today? I think at a lake. Okay. Like, before uh, the shoot, day. before the school shooting? Yeah. What, were you, what did you cut yourself with? A knife. Those little scratches on your arms? Feel <laughs> like Come on, man. I get worse scratches weeding my flower bed than that. You want to try to hurt yourself? <laughs> Wasn't sharp enough? How many knives do you have? Four, five. How long have you been cutting yourself? Years. Years? You ever cut yourself where you had to go to the hospital and get stitches? When you cut yourself, it's because the voice just told you to cut yourself. And if you didn't talk or you didn't listen to the voice then you were going to be alone because your voice was your only friend that's kind of what you're saying you know you have a biological brother since me and you have been talking have you heard the voices what's it say for you to cut yourself for you to cut yourself does the voice like me no does the voice like me it doesn't trust me why doesn't it trust me um, Pretty relaxed, ain't it? I'm trying, I'm trying to figure that out, too. Well, what does he like about me? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of grinning because I want to know what, what the voice's problem is with me. What does he like about me? I treated you fairly. He should have said, fuck the voice. Don't come out here and fight me then. You know? I'm too nice. I'm too nice. Yeah. <laughs> How many times has the voice talked to you while we've been in the room right here? A lot. Does the voice said, jump out of the chair and... Do anything bad to that policeman? He said it's, it's talking to him. It must be lunchtime. I don't really believe there is a voice, to be honest with you. No, I don't think there is. I'm trying to hurt this. No. I mean, I feel like you probably want to kill yourself because of what happened, but. No, the, the voice is telling me to kill myself. Okay, but the voice is telling you that the AR 15s is. You like guns, man. You want to be a ranger. You like guns. It's all right. There's cops like that. There's cops who got a 50 million guns. You didn't buy guns because the voice said, "Hey, today I like Mossbergs. Tomorrow I like AR-15s." You like guns? Hey, you punk bitch! Psychologists. Some of the questions I asked you were fun. Can't believe they arrested him without a motherfucking scratch on it. You ready? The questions were obviously from the investigation team and not a psychologist, but the suspect doesn't know this, and it's fascinating to observe his reaction when he sees the questions are not sympathetic in nature. He perhaps thought a psychotherapist would be asking him about his feelings and affording him some type of reassurance after he committed his murder, and he becomes very unsettled once he realizes the procedure won't be quite as sympathetic. Voices, are the inside or outside of your head? What do the voices say? These are all questions I asked you. How many voices? You said one. Whose voice do you think it was? You didn't know. I don't know. I, I don't understand why you can't admit you like guns. 
You want to talk to a psychologist? Why didn't you talk to a psychologist? Before. When the voices started? The voices telling me not to. And I listen. So why are you not listening you now then? Telling you not to talk to a psychologist? You ever go to church? No, I'm saying ever in your life. Yeah. Do you believe in God? I believe in God. What do you believe in? I feel like it's something. Okay. But if you believe in demons, do you believe in angels? Mm. Angels is the good. Demons are the bad. If you, when you say the word demon, you think it's an evil spirit? Or what do you think it is? Voice. The subject had earphones in during the mass shooting. The topic now lands on the music he was listening to. Well, well I mean, I'm, I'm sure we don't like the same music. What kind of music we listen to? Name the, name the group. No, it was Mark, Mark Green. Mark Green. You have to help me, Mark what? Mark something. Mm -hmm. What was the song though? Sad. That's the name of the song, Sad? No, uh... <laughs> Salad days. Salad days? Hold on one second. Oh, uh, Wait, you listen to one of those songs? What other songs you listen to? Um, just a lot of sad songs. Where? Did you pick the music yourself? Or did the demon pick the music? The demon and then myself. Actually. Where, which ones did you pick? The sad ones. Which ones did he pick? The evil ones. The evil ones. What's an e what's e well, give me an evil one compared to a sad one. You already gave me a sad one. What's an evil one? Pencer Minch. What? Pencer Minch. Pez Pencer Minch. And what does that say? That nigga said his way um, in his head got a playlist. Oh, no. Oh, well, there is lyrics, but I don't know what he means. But is, is it in English? Yeah. What language is it in? German. German? Do you, do you speak German? No. Then how do you know what the lyrics mean? I don't. So they could be happy, right? I don't know if they're happy or not. Well, again, they don't because you can't speak it. The demon shows that I didn't change. But you're up, you have one. How long do you think you had them on your, on your plate? <coughs> so you listen to them a lot of times? Hmm. So you had a playlist of music. The demon helped you pick out, but you picked out some of them. Hmm. I'm just having a tough time understanding this demon thing. Well, I don't know. The Xanax you were talking to me about earlier. Them Xannies! So you used to buy that? Other than Xanax and marijuana, what other drugs you ever, you never tried? Vodka? PCP? Cocaine? Heroin? No. Okay, Xanax, how many of those did you take when you, when you used to take them? Five. Okay, five, uh, what, 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 what side bar? How big, of, I mean, which, what color was it? Half, some color. Look what color? They all, white. White? Alright, but that was on them bars. Did they help you sleep? Made me drowsy. Did it make the, the demon go away? Yeah. When was the last time you think you did Xanax? A long time. So if the, if the Xanax helps you get the demons away. Same, marijuana does it better. Marijuana does it better? When was the last time you smoked marijuana? <laughs> I smoke right before the video. <laughs> you make it $1,200 a week, why do you smoke marijuana every day to get rid of the demon? Illegal. Is it illegal? It's illegal. And it's illegal. It was illegal whether you do it once a week or once, once every five minutes. Motherfucker so, wouldn't smoke weed because it was illegal, but he mowed like down a bunch of fucking children. Right, you bitch. The demon just light up a blood. I mean, you had the money, man. Okay. So the demon wanted you to do wrong, but then your good side didn't want to do wrong by smoking marijuana? Even though it made him go away. Even though it made him go away. Hmm.
Well, you didn't tell the doctor then you had anxiety problems and marijuana and Xanax cured your anxiety and made the demons go away. It seemed like an easy fix, man. If that's true. You sure you didn't like the demon voice? You sure? Sure. Then why didn't you go to a doctor and get rid of it? Why, 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 well, forget that for a second. Let me ask you another crazy question. Okay. Did the dean, was the demon there that night? Ian beat, beat you up on campus? Huh? Was the demon there that day when Ian beat you up on campus? He asked him, did the demon see him get them paws put on his motherfucking mouth? Mm -hmm. okay, so why didn't the demon do something to stop it? Huh? I don't know. That's a good question. Because the demons tell you to do all these bad things. Why couldn't the demon get you mad enough to get the best of Ian? Mm. I don't know. I don't know either. Does that make any sense? I don't know. The demon is this all-powerful thing that tells you to do bad things and you're afraid of it. Why didn't the demon just take over right then when Ian was getting the best of you and mm -hmm. get the best of Ian? So why, why, why did the demon... Let you get that? your ass beat. What do you think? I don't know. I, don't, I can't figure it out either because I don't think the demon exists. Okay. I think. I don't think it exists. Yeah, right. Can I, I, think, I think that... Go ahead, go ahead. Am I able to, like, think to myself about it? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm just thinking. Hey, you can think all you want. I'm just... No, I'm just thinking about the gym. Right. Well, you want me to leave you to think for a while and then I'll come back and talk to you. I, I personally, I think you're using the demon as an excuse. I'm not. I promise. You can stop the demon by getting a prescription for marijuana. You could stop the demon by getting a prescription for Xanax. You could stop the demon by illegally doing marijuana, which you were doing anyway. You could stop the demon by doing Xanax illegally, which you were doing anyway. You could stop the demon anytime you want. You didn't want to stop the demon. The subject seems to be coming to the realization that he's not going to be treated as a victim. As he begins to meet this reality, you will notice him exhibit signs of fear. You will then see him attempt to escape the confrontation by feigning a state of psychosis once more. The detective will recognize this, but this time will not afford reassurance. He will instead apply further condemnation, and a visibly frightening realization will engulf the suspect from that point forward. It's essentially the very beginning of retribution. The detective introduces him to the rest of his life at this moment. No, that's not true. That's you, you didn't. You could have. I've given you four ways you could have stopped the demon, man. Okay, now, you know, you're just acting like that because... No, 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 no. Okay, no, no, no. <laughs> You're just acting like that because I'm making sense. Calm down. Good. I'm Chill making out. sense and you don't like when it makes sense. No, 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 no. Because it doesn't fit into the story you're telling me. No, right no, I'm telling you the story. It's just, it's just true. It's just, well, why are you looking at your arm now? I'm, not, I'm trying to understand why. Well, 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 why didn't you want to stop I, the demon? I don't know. <laughs> because you, I think. No, no, don't cry now. now. Why did you stop it then? I don't like the demon. 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 Like the demon. Mm, that's, if, that's if the demon even exists. He picked his keys up. He like, I'm up out of here, bro. Can I get an attorney or something? You want what? An attorney? Yeah. Did the demon, did the, uh, the voice just tell you to get an attorney? Okay. Mm. Uh, we tell the voice that don't hit yourself in the head because the the, the attorney, the, the demon just requested, I will I will stop talking to you. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. You're scared of what? I'm scared of what? What? Why wouldn't you protect me, man? Ah, uh, he ain't gonna protect you where you're going neither, bitch. Alright, well just relax. You're done talking to me. Once again, 
Uh, he fucking with him. What you gonna do? than that. Nicholas Cruz was taken to the Broward County Jail, where he remains in isolation to this day. His trial date is yet to be scheduled. The 20-year-old mm. has been held without bond since last year's mass shooting that left 17 people dead. His attorney said he would plead guilty in exchange for a life sentence, but prosecutors rejected that offer and are seeking the death penalty. Y'all damn right. I agree with that. Y'all already know what the fate is. Let me know in the comments if this type of shit y'all fucking with. Uh, we probably going to see that got a lot of videos on their channel. So we going to get into some of that shit. And that's just what we do. Listen, my name is Hero. I'm from the South Side. If you ain't from my side, throw up your side, like, and subscribe, my nigga. Until the next video, it's game time, yes.